All right, well today is Mother's Day, and so happy Mother's Day to the mothers here. Um, I also wanna say that I know that many women find Mother's Day difficult for a variety of reasons. Um, we have all been born of a woman, and we have all been influenced by a variety of women who have played different roles in our lives. And so without listing all of the reasons why this is a hard day for some women, and perhaps also for some men, I want to remind us just how deeply God cares for us. While we refer to God as our Heavenly Father, there are scripture passages where God's love and care are compared to that of a mother. God is nurturing, and God loves us fiercely. So I want to share a few passages from the Bible where God's love is compared to the love of a mother. From Deuteronomy, like an eagle that rouses her chicks and hovers over her young, so he spreads his wings to take them up and carried them safely on his pinions. Now I will confess, I did not know what pinions were. They are the outer part of a bird's wing, including the flight feathers. Isaiah says, can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. See, I have written your name on the palms of my hands. In Psalm 91, we read, he will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. In Hosea, there is a rather graphic account of how God's love is compared to a mother bear protecting her cubs. And in Matthew, Jesus said this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. God's love is often compared to that of a mother. And on this Mother's Day, may we remember the variety of women that have spoken into our lives, and may we take comfort in the great, fierce, nurturing love of God. Um, I invite you to stand with me as we pray, and then remain standing as we sing. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning and this opportunity to gather to worship you. As we made our way here this morning, it was evident that there are fires burning in our province. And so we pray that you would send rain and that people and homes would not be lost. As we participate in this service in a variety of ways, may you be honored and may we be encouraged in our faith. May this time spent here bless us and draw us closer to you. Amen. Good morning. I love the first lines of the song, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach us some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Um, praise the mount, I'm fixed on it, mount of thy redeeming love. me 
from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace our great debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave a God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. What is our hope? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we come. Christ, our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, Holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death, oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal, oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess, Christ our hope in life and death.
and death, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. seated ushers please come forward lord 
help us in all our circumstances to choose the Jesus way, to choose to love, to choose to surrender. Um, and right now we choose to offer you our gifts, um, our finances, we give them to you. We ask you to, that you would be glorified in them and through them, that they would be put to good use and for the purposes of growing your kingdom. And uh, Lord, thank you that Christ, you are with us, that in you we live and move and breathe. And so with this breath in our lungs, forever we will sing. Thank you, team, for leading us in song this morning. Um, we have a few announcements. I'm going to invite up Tamira, who is going to have our first announcement.
Hello, everyone. So you have been seeing me in the foyer talking to you and asking you about what your hobbies are. Um, so I don't know if you guys have noticed, but we're a little bit of a smaller church than we used to be. People have noticed. <laughs> and maybe some of you have uh, lost some friends and some new people have come and we don't know each other all that well. And so this is an attempt to just get to know each other a little bit, okay? So in two weeks time, we wanna have a hobby show right here in church. I'm just gonna list, uh, just address some questions that have been coming my way, okay? First of all, I don't have any hobbies. And then people start talking about, well, yes, I knit things for my grandchildren. That qualifies as a hobby. Um, if you take pictures, that's a hobby. What about this? Playing musical instruments, that's called a hobby. Okay, I had one person which really interested me, he says, I just like to argue. Oh, let's call that a hobby. Let's call that a hobby, okay? We have room for, to celebrate all of your hobbies. Okay, what about if you're not very good at it yet? Guess what, that doesn't matter. Because the purpose of this isn't to display how great you are. The purpose of this is to give people an opportunity to get to know you, give people an opportunity to talk to somebody about something they have in common that they perhaps didn't know they had in common with a person. You understand that? Okay, so I do need some more musicians. I don't have very many people who build things. Okay, so if you have those things in mind, so in two weeks' time, in the afternoon, we're going to nail down the times, and you will, and you will uh, hear that, okay? Can friends come? Absolutely. I am not prepared to advertise this as this terrific hobby show yet, because we don't know what it's going to be like yet, right? But that doesn't mean you don't bring friends. If you have a friend who has a hobby and wants to show something with you, great, okay? So I'm going to continue to be there, listening and writing down names. And some of you have written down your name and you haven't really fully agreed to come yet, so it's time to think about that, okay? And then we will do this hobby show and we're gonna try this out and see how this goes. So far, I have enough people that we can go ahead, okay? So see you in two weeks doing that. <laughs> Thanks, Tamira. I'm looking forward to it. It should be a good afternoon. Uh, before I forget, because this isn't in my notes, these lovely flowers that you see here uh, were left for us to enjoy by Travis Reimer and Hildy Braun, who were married here yesterday afternoon. So, yes. They are obviously not here, um, but they did want us to enjoy these flowers. This Tuesday is the 55 plus gathering and you may or may not know that this past Thursday was Ascension Day and so traditionally the uh, seniors group, now the 55 plus group, um, oh, oh, what's that? It's in two weeks? It's not this week, sorry. Okay, it's not this week, but it was Ascension Day on Thursday. So I might have the 55 plus thing wrong, but Ascension Day was on Thursday. And so in two weeks, on the 22nd, did you say, Grace? 21st, 21st, there will be a 55 plus gathering with an Ascension Day themed reflection, and there will be some singing. So we invite you to bring your own mug and a snack to share as always. And in two weeks, we have the hobby show. We also have a special guest coming that Sunday morning to speak to us and share. Marlene Wall, who is the president of the Lithuania Christian College, uh, will be here and she will be our guest speaker in two weeks. So mark that down as well. If you were at our congregational meeting last week, you heard a pretty significant report about the family ministries, the kids' ministries, the youth ministries, the family activities that we have. And over the last year, these things have really grown and have become um, more than one or two people can handle. And so we are looking for people who would like to be involved in conversations about different family ministry, kid ministry activities, and also hopefully uh, help out. So if you are interested in getting involved, 
in kids and family ministries in some way, talk to Pastor Michaela. We are going to set a date uh, once we kind of know who's all interested and have a meeting to talk about how we can get more people involved in the leadership of those things. Now, it's pretty significant because these ministries are really a great way that we um, minister to and care for our own kids that are in our church family, but also kids and families in the community. And so it's just a great way to connect with families and to invite them into our church community. So remember, if you're interested in that conversation, talk to Pastor Michaela. And this next announcement is for a ways away, but you really need to pay attention. So if you've been like kind of drifting off because it's just announcements, this is the time to listen up. <laughs> because I know that happens, <laughs> just saying. This summer, there's three long weekends, July, August, and September. There will not be a service those Sundays. Those three long weekends will have a service Thursday night at seven beforehand. The rest of the summer, we will have Sunday morning services at 10, like we usually do. But the three long weekends, do not come to church on the Sunday because the doors will be locked. And there will be a sign saying that the service was on Thursday. So every summer, somebody comes on the Sunday, um, but we announce it a lot, and it's in all of the communications. So please, please, please take note of that. I know it's a little ways away, but we're going to talk about it probably every week, just in hopes that um, everybody knows and doesn't come on a Sunday on the long weekend. This is just a way to bless the many people who are involved in our Sunday morning services and give them three long weekends off where they can also enjoy the beautiful summers that we have. They are short and so it's just a nice way to bless the many people who are involved on a Sunday morning. And with that, I would invite you to pray with me. Why don't you stand as we pray together? Let's pray. God, we thank you that we can gather so easily like this to worship you. We have freedoms and abundance in our country that many do not have. May we be grateful and may we not take these blessings for granted. God, we pray for the places in the world where there is suffering due to war and other injustices and where there is oppression of various kinds. May your hope and love be evident in your people that live in these places, and may they have strength and wisdom for daily life. We pray too for leaders around the world, that they would be humble and see the needs of the people that they lead, and may they have an awareness of you and turn to you. God, as we live in our city, May we too have wisdom and compassion and consider the different ways that we can be in a, a, a light in a city where many are struggling. And as we strive to be a faithful church here at McIver, may we be instruments of your love, grace, and mercy to those we meet. May we have generous hearts and may your light shine through us. Lord, thank you for Michaela. And as she shares a message with us this morning, may you speak through her and may you give us ears to hear and hearts that are open to what you want us to absorb this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And Kathy's going to read our scripture this morning. The scripture reading is from Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, to chapter 2, verse 4, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Philippians 1, verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. 
For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. The word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. So I want to start with a question. Now I want you to raise your hand if you've ever disagreed with someone. (laughs) Some of you are lying out here because not everyone has their hand raised. Now again, raise your hand if you've ever disagreed with someone and when discussing said disagreement, you handled the situation poorly. (laughs) Okay, that was better. There are many times in our lives where we have and will disagree with people. I mean, I've had experiences where good, healthy conversation can come from it. But on the other hand, there are times when it creates further division and it can be really difficult with that person going forward. And the church is no stranger to clashing in opinions. I mean, consider all the denominations that come out of the Christian faith because of different theological views. But more and more, I have seen differences in opinion. And I don't know if I only started noticing when I got more involved in church or if it was things like COVID that have heightened some of these differences. But I also found it fitting that when I recently went to a conference in Idaho, we talked about things like faith deconstruction. We talked about women and abuse in the church. We talked about LGBTQ and politics. So basically all the conversations that Christians either get riled up about or they like to avoid. And I was amazed at how the conference went about many of these issues. There were speakers who had many different views on many different things, and yet there was still a space to talk about them without making assumptions or getting angry at the other. There were well-researched ideas coming from different positions, And there was a mutual love for Christ, which was obvious, and it stood out and above the disagreement. Part of why I think I was amazed by this at the conference is because some of my recent experiences here in Winnipeg have been a little bit of the opposite. So I hear from friends that their churches are divided on specific issues, and it creates tension and takes away from the passion of serving or when I attended the special assembly about River East a while ago. I heard hurtful words on all sides, words that did not seem to come from a place where Christ was at the center. There are people who will hear you say that you're more conservative or you're more liberal, and they're automatically assuming a million things about you, and they become defensive. Some people will distance themselves if there is disagreement on certain secondary beliefs. Now, these are things that I've witnessed and I've heard uh, coming from the church body. And so going to this conference into a, a space where things are still talked about with this sharp disagreement, these people could remain united in the fact that they were sinners, that they were saved by a good God, and that they were trying their best to follow Christ. And so this brings up our scripture reading for today. In Philippians, the last couple weeks, we have gone through the importance of the greeting. Um, Last week, Cheryl gave us a picture of hope. But now Paul's letter moves on to state the importance of unity. And so our whole passage for today can be seen through the light of the opening verse, which says, whatever happens, conduct yourself yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so if you forget anything that I say today, at least remember what Paul is saying here. He's saying that may the gospel of Christ be shown through the way that we are conducting ourselves. 
Now, Paul is writing to a group of people who have experienced great pressure. Philippi was a place that had many Roman army veterans, um, and there was a deep allegiance to Roman law and customs. This made following the way of Christ difficult and discouraged. Now, knowing this little piece of historical context helps us as we read the book of Philippians. Paul is encouraging the people to stand firm, to strive together in one faith of the gospel, and to not be frightened of those who oppose them. But with that, Paul is really honest. He's in Philippians 1, verse 29, he says that following Christ will likely bring persecution, and there will be suffering for the faith. I mean, Paul himself is literally writing letters to the church from prison, and so surely they understand the seriousness of committing to Christ. As we move forward into chapter 2, we learn more about the reasons why the people might be experiencing disunity at the time. Rather than a difference of opinion on theological issues, kind of like I was saying earlier, their biggest threat to unity, or yeah, sorry, the biggest threat of division comes from this idea of hierarchy. It has been ingrained into their heads that one's rank in society makes them superior. And we know that this is not the way of Christ at all. But to unlearn this idea that's been so deeply entrenched into their world, this would have been an area that the church would have to actively work against if they wanted to be more unified and living in true community. And I know that there are times where hierarchy is present today, but my bigger concern for the current church is disunity based on secondary theological differences and not just the, the object of disagreement itself, but more so the way that we talk about it and how we treat those who disagree. In my experience, when there is major division on secondary issues and people begin mistreating each other, this sucks the passion and joy out of ministry and it can suck the life out of a church. We are missing the point if secondary issues are becoming our only topic of conversation. And so a good question here is what are secondary issues? To answer this, I'd like to begin by first looking at primary issues or core beliefs, and this can help us focus more on what is essential. And so one speaker at the conference showed some examples of what, uh, what are essential core beliefs. And so some of those include the fact that we are sinners in need of a savior. We believe that Christ died for our sins and that he was resurrected on the third day. We believe Jesus is the only way to God, as he said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We believe the scriptures are inspired and trustworthy. Now, there were a few other ones that he mentioned, but these are some of the main core beliefs as Christ followers. And so these are things that Christians should all be on the same page about. Then there are secondary issues. Creation viewpoints, I know young earthers, I know old earthers, uh, end time viewpoints, heaven and hell descriptions, women in ministry, the frequency of communion, all these kinds of things. They, it's important, they remain very important, but they are not vital truths that we depend our faith on. And then there are other conversations that are not doctrinally important, such as styles of worship music, uh, maybe a certain dress code, um, the order of a church gathering, things like that. And so we need to make sure that we know what constitutes a primary essential core belief and what is a secondary belief. And so if something is considered a secondary doctrine, that doesn't mean that we should downplay its potential impact on the church or avoid the conversation simply because we can agree to disagree. But to be clear, these secondary issues are not essential for salvation or a relationship with Christ. Now, there should always be a place to talk about our concerns, about our biblical convictions, and the better we're able to talk about these issues, the smaller and smaller the divides will be, regardless of whether we end up agreeing. When we don't earnestly talk about different issues with people who have opposing viewpoints, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice. And it's very easy to stick with those who always agree with us. It's a really comfortable space to live. 
but by doing so, we are limiting our understanding of other people's stories, their views on theology. We are not stretching our learning abilities. I once heard someone on a podcast say that simply giving the mic to someone who you disagree with does not mean that you affirm that belief. And so it's okay to venture out of your comfortable space and be challenged by opposing views. What if we pressed into the uncomfortableness of disagreeing with a fellow believer? What if we strive to understand their position, not necessarily to agree, but to have a genuine understanding of why they believe that way? What if we created a space that allowed for difficult questions, asking how the Bible has informed these decisions? And with this, let us be wise in how we form our opinions and views. For example, I've said to people who are both affirming and non-affirming of same-sex marriage, I say, okay, this is your belief. Where does that come from? Do you have a concrete understanding of why you believe this? Do you simply believe because it's tradition? Or do you believe because culture is pushing you to? Where is the Bible leading in this conversation? What does the Bible say about marriage? All of these things. So as Christians, it is our duty to know why we believe what we believe. And there should be a space in the church to wrestle with these matters. Some of the most fruitful conversations I've witnessed or been a part of come from people who have opposing views. When people have earnestly searched and prayed, reading the Bible with integrity, going beyond their comfort zone, these are the people that I want to have conversation with. Because even though we may come to different conclusions, we can grow in love for each other and we can continue to strive for unity in Christ above all else. What if we could live by example as Christians, not abandoning unity when it gets a little difficult, and we all know it does. If we chose to unite through Christ as the highest priority, perhaps our churches wouldn't divide as much as they do. Then maybe they wouldn't push people to the edge where they lose their faith because how can believers in Jesus be so hateful towards each other? These are things that I want us to consider as we read these words of Paul and how they might apply for the church today. Now, a specific moment that stood out when I was at this conference, there was a man speaking and he was talking about his experience as a gay person in the church. He mentioned how he prayed and prayed for his situation to be different. He prayed for years that God would take away this attraction to men. And through wrestling with this part of his life and his reading of scripture, he had the conviction that marriage was between a man and a woman. And so he continued his journey as a celibate gay man following Christ. But just as for gay and straight people, singleness and celibacy can come with their own temptations and struggles. Something that this man stressed was the importance of community. Now, if you're married, it can sometimes be easy to take for granted the feeling of closeness, um, the feeling of constantly having someone in your life. Maybe you have children, so the feeling of this group surrounding you. When we talk about, or when he talked about how to best serve single people in the local congregation, he said that God's law commands sacrificial community and not just sexual integrity. So sacrificial community. In his life, this meant people intentionally welcoming him into daily life, inviting him into their messy homes and doing everyday tasks together. People were intentionally giving their time to surround him with Christ's love. This is sacrificial community. And the reason I mention this is because it goes far beyond singleness. What does sacrificial community look like in light of our scripture today? How might we be more unified through sacrificial community? We can find the answers right in Philippians, Philippians where we read. Chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In order to be unified, we must sacrifice selfish ambition. We must sacrifice our pride. 
we must sacrifice some of our self-interest. One study Bible says it this way. It says, selfish ambition can ruin a church, but genuine humility can build it. Being humble involves having a true perspective about ourselves, but it does not mean we should put ourselves down. Before God, we are sinners, saved only by God's grace, but we are saved and therefore have worth in God's kingdom. We are to lay aside selfishness and treat others with respect and common courtesy. Considering others' interests as more important than our own links us to Christ, who is the true example of humility. Now, these ideas of humility, self-sacrifice, courtesy, they also help guide our conversations when we disagree. If we begin with humility, we may truly learn from someone else. Have you ever been in a heated discussion and you hear about two seconds of what they're saying, but for the rest of the time that they're talking, you're thinking about how you're going to respond to them? If we're selfishly waiting for the next, I, by the way, I've done that too, but if we're selfishly waiting for the next opportunity to cut in and refute someone's idea, we're not truly listening. And this is not building community or unity. If we begin with the idea of sacrificial community, we might find more agreement and common ground than we would have expected. If our conversations begin and end with Christ at the center, we should be able to leave knowing that Jesus loves our brothers and sisters. I never want to be in a church where everyone must agree on every single piece of secondary theology. It's really easy to remain united when we all have the exact same belief. But what I think is a true show of unity is to say that we do, agree, we do disagree on some of these issues, but our allegiance to Christ and spreading his gospel is more important and worth uniting for. This is, what the, this is the church that I want to be a part of, where we can have discussions on topics we disagree on and come out of it with more knowledge, more understanding, and still loving each other as Christ loved the church. Now, I, I will admit that this message has differed a little bit from Paul's original letter to the church. Their issues were slightly different than ours, and their decision to stand firm against opposition, it sometimes came at a big price. But I want to bring us back to what Paul is saying here in the opening verse, where he says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is the reason that we should strive to be united, even in disagreement. This is the reason we must pursue sacrificial community. When we conduct ourselves in these ways, the gospel of Christ is shown. When we can remain humble and united, even after a sharp theological disagreement, this shows the sentiment that Paul is talking about. It shows a Jesus-centered approach to the church and the wider community. And so may we encourage healthy biblical debates. May we be Christ-like in how we approach these conversations. May we be attentive to our community and how we might have to sacrifice and serve for others. And may all of this be done with the goal of unity in Christ, the one who died for all of our sins and loves each of his family members. Thank you.